Um, okay. So, uh, hi, this is Joe Maycook with the PHS Cultivating Community Garden Histories Project and the Norris Square Project. It is October 18th, 2021, and I am here on Zoom for a conversation with Peter A. Grove about the history of uh, the Norris Square Neighborhood Project's gardening efforts. Um, so Peter, I want to uh, question about your background. Um, Fine. My background in horticulture, yes. Yes. Where did you grow up and did uh, you or your neighbors have gardens there? I grew up in a small village called Send, S-E-N-D, in, in the county of Surrey in southeast England. Uh, yes, we had a vegetable garden and my neighbors had vegetable gardens and especially my next door neighbor, Mr. Main, whose garden was a foot higher than ours because he really was a gardener and he put compost. And uh, I, I'm not sure that he didn't empty his uh, sewage pit sometimes onto the garden. And uh, we had a rock garden, we had ornamental flowers and bushes. My dad loved gardening. Um, that was that in my home. I used to help my father all the time, cutting hedges, you know, planting things. Uh, my uncle had a beautiful sunken garden down by the river. He had a boathouse that he made money with, renting out canoes and boats. But he sold the sand in his garden and replaced it with topsoil, but at a level where the river, the water table in the river, was just a little under the roots of his vegetables. I thought that was very clever. Um, I worked as a young man before leaving school at a little nursery right opposite. I was the right-hand person doing everything there and then selling vegetables on the weekend, but I would you know, plant, dig, propagate. And then when I left school at 15, I left school at 15 and worked on a commercial uh, greenhouse salad crop place with almost six acres of glass. And we grew uh, lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and cress under glass. And I worked there for two years. And that was wonderful. I mean, you, you saw some amazing things in those greenhouses. And then I, they let me go to a, a local college, a horticultural agricultural place called Merrist Wood Farm Institute. And one day a week, my second year at this salad crop place, they sent me to this place and paid me to uh, learn about horticulture. And then after two years of working with these salad crops, I signed up to become a full-time live-in student for a year at Marist Wood. And then there were seven horticultural students and 49 agricultural students. And we became the magnificent seven. And uh, I somehow graduated top student out of seven students. <laughs> Um, and that was a wonderful experience. Then I went on to become a painter, then a roofer, and then I ended up uh, being in landscape gardening. And then I joined the part-time army, and then I met a friend who wanted me to cycle around the world with him. So we set off around the world on bicycles, but we only got as far as Athens. And then we ran out of money. Oh, I had plenty of money. I still had $100. But then we worked on a ship for nine months and paid off in Portland, Maine. We then cycled our bikes up to Montreal, across Canada, down through the Rockies, out across the deserts to Los Angeles, where he met his wife. And that ended his trouble. And then a bit more horticultural experience. I set off once more to go to India this time, but not with the bike, hitchhiking. 
And so I hitchhiked to India and there were, found a, a volunteer group called Frère des Hommes who was sinking irrigation wells for untouchable people in the, uh, the very poor people in the state of Bihar. And they took me on because of my horticultural, agricultural experience. And I was the one getting the villages started once the wells were in and the irrigation was running. Very hot, dry area. Is that enough? <laughs> Uh, th that was that was really informative um great about your background I guess um I am now curious though because you've gone through like three continents in this discussion um, if you yes. could then take us from there into how you eventually came back how you came to Philadelphia fine um one day while working in India I drove my jeep into the ashram to pick up some rice seed or something like that or to, to discuss with the Buddhan leader there the upcoming work and there was this pretty young lady from America and she was one of over the time I was there she was one of several people that they said oh this person's traveling through would you show them the work you are doing with the Buddhan movement in the 30 villages we were sinking about 130 wells in the, and I said, yes. So this young, I arranged to meet this young lady next day and I drove her down to show her some of the work and we realized we kind of liked each other. And so she ended up staying in India, but working about a hundred miles from where I was down in Ambikapur, working as a, a teacher nurse aide at a Catholic mission down there. She's not Catholic, but, and so uh, that's how she ended up being in India for a year working there. Then she came to visit me in New Zealand after I'd finished my two year stint in India. <coughs> and then I came to visit her here in, in Pennsylvania. And we were trying to decide if whether or not we would get married. And while she was working, I volunteered at the Schoolkill Valley Nature Center. And I was a teacher trainee. And one of the other teacher trainees was a Quaker lady called Natalie Kempner. And now you begin to see the connection to Norris Square. And Natalie came to me one day, almost within a week or two of my starting working alongside her and said, Peter, have you ever been to college? And I said, well, I've been to horticultural college. She said, no, 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 no. I mean, university. Have you been to a unit? I said, no, I left school at 15 and uh, I haven't. Would you like to go? She said. And I said, well, whether I would like to or not, I have about $200. And a, and a tourist visa that expires in three or four months, and I have to decide whether or not we're going to get married. She said, well, I've been talking with my husband, Fritz. He teaches at Penn Charter, and we think that you should go to college. And furthermore, if you would like to go, we will tell the authorities that we will be responsible for you for four years. I said, what? She said, we won't, we won't give you a nickel, but we will tell the authorities that we will be responsible for you. We think you should go to college. We think you should get a degree. You could be a good teacher or whatever. So within a month, they'd shown all their wherewithal as far as finances were concerned. And the next thing I knew, I had a student visa. And I went to Monco Community College which in those days was $215 a semester. And, and she said, well, we have a few jobs. You can earn $5 an hour and our neighbors have some money that you can earn some money on. Are you still there, Joe? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I apologize. I muted myself because I don't want to get any getting my voice the my noises in the way. So you switch me off. Story. Good, good. Yes. Uh, good. No. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Next question. That's oh. So um, I went to the community college for two years. Transferred to Penn. I didn't know that Penn was a special place. In fact, I enjoyed the community college. The college much more than Penn, but I crewed at Penn and went to Penn for two years, then went on to the grad school of ed and got my MS in elementary, uh, elementary science teaching. And then I went to work at a school called Mequon School and I made gardens at Mequon School with my kids and made bicycle wheel water wheels in the stream out at Mequon. And then after teaching there three years, my wife and I decided to take all of our savings. I had more than $100 now and decided that we would take a year and go around the world. So our children had not been born yet. So we took off for a year with a ticket each with 56 flights on it. And we spent 11 months going around but halfway around, I was in New Zealand where my sister had emigrated and I got a letter from, from Natalie saying, Peter, when you come back, would you consider taking over the directorship of the Norris Square Neighborhood Project instead of going back directly into teaching? And I agreed to do that. And so that was uh, 1983. Mm, let me think. What did I say? I I think that was more about nine. I think that was more about 1981. Okay. And I worked there for a little over five years at Norris Square. until about 1986 or seven, because I know I started teaching at Friend Central School where I made more gardens uh, in 1987. And then I taught at Friend Central School for 30 years. I got trapped because my kids went there for free. <laughs> they don't pay so well, but there is this thing where if you have up to two children, they will go all the way through from nursery or pre-K up through 12th, get a wonderful education. Friend Central is a wonderful education. And if you're a teacher, it's it's part of your payment, part of your mm -hmm. payment. Okay. Um, and so the, well, uh, another, I guess, another question that probably goes a little bit back in the chronology, but I just wanted to establish that chronological note. Um, kind of, you know, at that moment. Um, in the credits for your piece on, um, on Andrea's tree, um, yes. Um, right. Yes. It notes that you're, that, you're a, that you're a master gardener. So- No, I'm not. You have to oh, be okay. a gardener. Or this, this, this term, master gardener, is banded around as if it was nothing. I know a lady who took a three week course somewhere and she now tells everybody she's a master gardener. My granddad was a gardener all of his life and he would never claim to be a master gardener. But anyway, carry on. Okay, that's all That's all I wanted to ask about there. Um, thank you for clarifying that. I, I mean, I guess uh, I, would, I, would, I was just wondering where, like, but you've explained fairly well your certification, at least graduating from the horticultural school. Um, yes. So, yes, that was good to know. Um, so, uh, I want to bring us back to um, 1981 um, and you coming to Norris Square Neighborhood Project as the director. Um, so, yes. could, you could you talk a little bit about you know, the state of the project at that time and what your responsibilities were for it? Yeah, the state of the project at that time was fabulous. I cannot claim to be the person that made Norris Square great. Between Natalie, the teachers that were there, 
um, and Sister Carol Keck, who would come over from the from the the Catholic school to help out. I walked into a situation that was pretty well established with lots of good programs. I just brought more energy and I saw myself as being somebody who should raise the money, make the place good, do all the jobs, work with some kids, but give the teachers there the freedom that they needed to be as creative as they were. And it was, it was a great time. Um, when I walked in the door, I'd heard that they'd been given a grant from the city to do some changes to the building. And what had been proposed was that they would knock out this beautiful bay window that looked over a garden, which at this time wasn't nice, and close the window off and make it a sort of a in-house amphitheater stepping down. And I looked at that and thought, what? That's awful. So I went straight up to the group that was funding it and said, we don't want that. We want to keep that beautiful bay area where the kids sit. Can we instead have a greenhouse? Can we have a greenhouse? And they said, well, who will design it? Well, I had a friend called Bob Thomas who said, I will for free design you an Exolite, very well-built solar greenhouse, plus a trombe wall facing south for the two floors above it. As long as you will build it and not ask me to come down every five minutes to say, how does this work? How does that work? You can call me and Bob Thomas of, of uh, Thomas Campbell and Thomas Architects, South Philadelphia. He's an amazing person who just is a walking historian archivist of trails and transportation in, in, in Pennsylvania and the cycling coalition. He drew this plan so that, you know, I could build this. And so Natalie's son and I worked together and built the whole thing. Wait a minute. Oh. Are you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So um, that, wait, when uh, you say Natalie's son and you still built it, you mean Peter Kent? Peter Kent, right. Yeah. Who, whom we still meet up with. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you go on a bit, I, I, I could, yeah, as I said, just to make the place nice. You know, my, my job was to make the place nice, paint it, but you could go, it'll sound awkward if you switch me back on to record, but I could tell you now I made the place secure. Um, I put in a fish pond with the kids put flowers, a curving brick path, um, hanging baskets. We filled the greenhouse with plants. Iris was helping. Um, that's as far as the structure. We made storage in the basement, painted the place from top to bottom, made it nice. I think Natalie knew I was sort of handy as well. You know. My job was also to raise the money, pay the wages. I got a vehicle from the place. I managed to have Norris Square Neighborhood Project that was getting a small amount of money. I think it was about $10,000 a year from the United Way. I went and made a presentation. I think Natalie was there, but I made the presentation and we became a United Way member agency where we didn't have to apply every year and they upped the money they were giving us to something like 25,000. We had a great 
we, we got ourselves a great reputation with the funding places like Glenmead, Doughty, Beatty Trust, McMahon. And I, I used to worry about raising money, but in fact, never really had a problem raising money. I, I seem to have some skill writing, but I think people, and I would send really good photographs of the kids canoeing, gardening, doing whatever, rock climbing, and, or being on trips, uh, or the murals that Andrea did with the children, so that there was almost no hesitation about giving us money. I remember once I, I wrote asking for a vehicle and the man knew of me and said, well, Peter, keep it short. Just, just, just a little note, right? And within a week, he called me and said, yeah, you have a 15 seater van. And uh, if you need a little extra money to paint a logo on it, do that. And then even after I'd left Norris Square, Sister Carol called me back and said, look, like 15 years later, you were so good getting us a van. Can you get us another one? <laughs> and I did, you know. But, and Sidney Replier, who worked for the Philadelphia Foundation, what a gracious person he was. Uh, Sidney Replier would, would love to come down there now and again and just be with the Norris Square neighborhood kids and that, not often. But uh, he's and he once said, "This is this is you, this agency is one of my favorite favorite agencies." I also made a point that when I gave grants, if it was a big one, I wouldn't mail it. I would walk down to the Glen Mead office and give it to him, right? So they'd see me. They could see I wasn't too crazy. Wow. Okay. That. Was, I that was a really interesting informative story, especially with the like hand delivering grants. But I wanted I to. Missed, cool. Oh. I missed out a lot, but it doesn't matter. But go on. Well, yeah. you got you got enough to get two vans, sure. including yeah, one I'm when you weren't there. Um, but so I wanted to, um, I guess, talk a little bit more though about the spaces that you built, like this, you know, brick pathway, um, this greenhouse the pond, mm. et cetera. So what kind of yearly traditions um, characterize uh, the work to maintain these spaces and the uh, recreation and education that you know the children of the Neighborhood Project and others benefiting from its services um, you know, had in this space? All right. I think part of it for me was to have the children see that if you roll your sleeves up and do something, you will end up with a result. And the fact that you did it is going to make that result even more important to you and more meaningful to you. So um, I made gardens with the children at Hunter School McKinley School, uh, the garden at Norris Square Neighborhood Project. I made two more gardens with the children at the southeast and southwest corners of Norris Square. They are no longer there. We planted trees at Moffitt School. Um, I also worked with children outside of the area at Belmont School at 42nd and Brown. We put a garden in there. And then I worked with children to put another garden in at 6th and 5th and Federal, 5th and Federal or just below Washington Street. And we also took neighborhood children and put a garden in against a low wall on which um, Andrea uh, painted a mural with the children at the Centennial Hall out in West Fairmount Park. And it was a kind of a curious mural, mural showing the staff uh, sitting with the kids around them. You can see, you know, my big bottom and uh, 
kids and you can see Efrain's car, Andrea's car, my car, and uh, and all the little kids sitting in a circle. It's rather nice. Uh, later, my wife and I uh, were the prime movers of a 93 plot community garden at 25th and Spruce, the Schoolkill Gardens. We we my wife was the one who got the deed for that, and I was the one that went out with a, some helpers and marked out 93 plots, you know, but, but that's not Norris Square. Um, I'm trying to think what else here. Yeah. switch on. Well, uh, actually, I would, I do want to do a quick se segue. If you could talk any, like, I think that it might be good, I guess, to interview you again about the um, school kill gardens but do you know its current state um just out of oh, the school kill gardens yes yes uh you switch on again and i'll tell you um i believe i'm still recording i don't think i've stopped oh anything. okay all right the school kill gardens is flourishing the interesting thing about the school kill gardens we made it and we divvied up the plots 20 by 10 15 by 10 10 by 10 people moved in it was the old Kelly Brickyard, and it was pretty tough digging for some of it, uh, but we managed it. And then we discovered that the, the city manager, I think his name was Leo Brooks, moved into an apartment right opposite. And when he looked down and saw all the plastic windmills and the flamingos and the watering cans hanging on sticks, he said, we can't have that. And so we quickly rushed to him and to the city and made a presentation. And because he had to look at it, all of a sudden the city found funding somewhere from that school kill development area, you know, with the walkway and the cycle track along the river. All of a sudden, our rickety old fence was taken down and there was a dipping well and a brick entrance way and iron wrought railings and a fine, you know, iron wrought entrance. And that was it. You know, oh, one thing I wanted to say about the different gardens, I started with the kids at Norris Square and where Andrew would paint murals behind was that many of them, uh, oh, and these gardens only started with help from PHS. I couldn't have done any of them without PHS giving fencing and, and mushroom compost. That many of these little gardens, the kids got awards from PHS. And I would take them down, Andrea, Efrain, and I would take them down to Penn's Landing. And Herb Clark, who I think was a, some sort of weather report man at that time on the, on the television, they were presented with $50 checks for their combined efforts on their gardens. And so that was special for the kids to go to Penn's Landing, Port of History, come back and we'd spend 50 bucks on, on ice cream, you know, which was great. <laughs> That's really good, yeah. Uh, I, that would blow my mind as a kid. Um, so, right. um, I'm glad that you were able to do that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but I wanted to also ask a quick point of clarification. I think you mentioned a frame a lot. Um, yes. Yes. Who is that for the record? Okay. Okay. The, the teachers I had, uh, Efrain Rios was a young Puerto Rican man who uh, was married and had two children. What was it Tony and Seely? Silly. And he was a very creative teacher and he had a lot of humor and he had energy and the kids loved him, but he really did have a sense of humor. I remember we were coming back from a canoe trip one day and I'd gone in to get donuts or something for the kids at a diner down in New Jersey. And it's a windy day and I'm coming back with a tray full of stuff and all the kids are laughing like crazy. And I said, what's going on there? What's going on? And they said, Efrain. I said, what, what did he say? He, they said, well, it, when Efrain saw you coming across the parking lot, he said, here he comes, the eagle's nest with one egg in it, you know, because <laughs> a bit bored. And, and on these canoe trips, Efrain, you know, he and I, I remember once we went ahead because we knew there was this mud spot in the bank. We dashed ahead in a canoe 
and jumped out with their swimsuits on and covered ourselves with yellow mud. And when the canoe came by, we all leapt out of the bushes like wild men, you know. And after that, all the kids piled out and smeared themselves with mud, bright yellow mud. So he was a wonderful guy. Um, he was just a joy. And then Andrea was a very strong, very capable person. I think in a way, sort of Andrea kept us all in line, not the kids, but she was an artist, a gifted teacher, um, very hardworking and a good organizer. But she once described me as being like the Pope. I don't know what that means. I guess she saw me as some sort of a figurehead and was grateful that I was good at raising money. And I'm still in touch with Andrea. She's not experiencing the best of health. But boy, was she a fabulous teacher. And she <clears throat> kind of organized. What you probably didn't know is that at that time, there were so many uh, uh, programs at Norris Square uh, where local children were involved with schools elsewhere like Green Street Friends, Penn Charter, Germantown Friends. But also we worked with Moffitt, Hunter, and McKinley, every day we would go and get kids from there. She would, and Ephraim, and Iris. They would pick up kids from those schools and bring them to Norris Square for lessons on all kinds of things. I think you need to know that at that time, Norris Square Neighborhood Project was an urban environmental education center. It focused on that. The whole point being for the children to look at their environment, that right there in Kensington, to look at it and see in what ways can you improve that? In what ways can you make that a better living space? So Natalie would have them going out, mapping the trees in the park, recording the conditions of them. She created in the basement of Miller School before it was torn down. That was a school right now where the retirement home, you know, the Carmen Aponte Center is. She, even before she bought 2141 North Howard Street with Helen Loeb, who was a friend of hers, she created a nature center in the basement of that school where all the boilers were and the pipes. And she had the kids wrapping all the pipes with chicken wire and covering it with papa mache. She brought in bird's nests and rocks and plants and flowers. And, and then she heard that Miller School was to be torn down and she would lose all of that. And she had this wonderful relationship with the children. So she quickly looked around and wouldn't you know the house right next door that faced south, right next door to Miller School came up for sale and she and Helen Loeb grabbed it to make it the Norris Square Neighborhood Project. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to, I guess, ask related to that, if you would say your experience at the Schuylkill, um, I think you said it was the Schuylkill Valley? Yes, um, it was called the Schuylkill Valley Nature Center, if you make a note at that time. Yes. Um, and so that, so that kind of precipitated your work with NSMP as an urban environmental education center. Right. A little, a little bit. I suspect it was my upbringing in England because where I lived was this beautiful river and the river way and my family, there's, there's, there's been an historical uh, treaties written on my family called River Family that we were connected with that river for over 350 man working years and it was that river where I played for years and years and years that formed for me a love of the environment and animals and open spaces and nature. 
Um, yes, um, I think working at the Schoolfield Valley was a small part of it, but they just taught me a few teaching things or I taught them, I don't know what. Um, but no, I, it, it was more my growing up in England that really got me on the line for that. Okay. Um, thank you for elaborating that. Um, that I'm going to have to look up that uh, book about the Grove family now. Um, I wanted to, I think that now, now that you've informed me that Andrea um, still alive, I'd like to maybe ask her a bit more about the story as well. Um, yes. But oh, the fire story? Yes. Yes. The story of Andrea's tree. Oh, that was um, a great story. Yeah. Yes. And so this, I want to also clarify. Um, so this was 1987 when it occurred. Um, I think it was near the end of my time. The kids came rushing in the building. Peter, the tree is on fire out there. And we all went rushing out and somebody had set fire. They put paper and junk in the bottom of a hollow tree. And there was smoke pouring out of the top of it. And you couldn't get to the the flames, but we'd called the fire brigade and the fire brigade came and they jumped off these big beefy fellows with axes. And one of them started to belabor the tree. And Andrea said, no, sir, I beg you, no. And he said, you know, stand back lady. And then she fell on her knees and he's trying to swing the ax and she grabs hold of his thigh, right? <laughs> and she's saying, I implore you. And we didn't realize he was so religious, but he said something like Jesus Christ or something. And then the other guy said, come on, Harry, you know. And so he put his, you know, he stepped back and the other fireman quickly put a step ladder against the side of the tree because it wasn't that tall. And they tipped two buckets of water in the top and that dealt with it. As simple as that. So it became like Andrea's tree after that. You know, it's it's not there now, but it it lasted for years after that. You know. So yes. Um. So and then you you um ended up publishing that story. Um. I believe. I did. I, yes. So if you could I like talk to through write. the process of that. <laughs> I, I like to write, and I tell you what. Um. I'm working currently. This is just going off this briefly. I did contact PHS not long ago. I've been working on a stream restoration project here in Narbeth, and it's and it's really nice. It was a stream that was badly eroded, like cliffs four feet high in two sections. Well, we all got together to fix that. But then porcelain berry, that wild grape, came in and blanketed so much of it and I decided that I would make it an occupation of myself to go in there over the last year and a half or so with a mattock and dig out all of this porcelain. Well, I haven't got all of it, but I got most of it. And I'd been replacing it with thousands of wild flowers and uh, n everything's native. So, and I just did a list. I took, if you're interested, I can send you uh, the photographs I took this year of the result, there are something like 46 kinds of native wildflowers. And you'll see there's butterflies and hummingbirds. And it's been wonderful. I'm sure I'm upsetting a couple of the neighbors because they like to see it all mowed, you know, so that the erosion was rampant. But, now, but most of the neighbors and people coming through and I built steps down so the kids can still get to the stream. I'm not saying to the kids, you can't go to the stream. So I put in five sets of steps. Where were we? Oh, Norris Square, right, okay. Yeah, I mean, I do, I, do, I would be happy for you to send me anything and everything about that project as well, because it sounds very Wonderful. interesting. Yes, I, I, lo I, I love native plants, you know, um, but, um, I, but I did want to, I did want to, I guess, get into the process of, you know, publishing the story of, you know, uh, Andrea, Andrea's tree. Um, yes. Yes. I, I don't know how 
how I got to the forestry magazine or whether Natalie said, that's such a cute story. Why don't you send that story to uh, the National Forestry Magazine? So I did and they grabbed it up straight away, you know. So it was just it was just that you had written it or that you had thought about writing it and Natalie Kempner said you ought to consider publishing it. Right. Uh, you need to know that I am always writing stories. I have about 146 stories. Uh, most of them finished. Um, I am a storyteller. That was one of my jobs at at Norris Square was to tell stories. That's how I teach. A, a, a fair part of my being a science teacher is not hands-on and go out in the woods and build bridges and plant. Oh, you want to know how many gardens I've made at Fred Central? No, but, but telling stories. So yeah, I like to write stories. And about 12 years ago, I had what was thought to be possibly a serious terminal illness. And so I thought, wow, I better sit down and write about my wonderful, happy childhood. So I wrote about 1,200 pages about my childhood. And so it was just magical. And, and many of those stories come from there, but I also write all kinds of silly stories and serious stories and I wrote a play once that got me award from the Annenberg Theater. This was when I was still a student at Penn. I wrote a 40 page play called Timepiece. I don't think they ever performed it but I won a hundred dollar prize and I bought the suit I got married in from this uh, story. Um, that, that's very cool as well. Um, so I guess at this point, I want to, I think now that we've talked a bit about Andrea mm. and about, um, and Efrain and that really um, helped introduce their roles to me. I wanted to though, ask you about Iris Brown. Um, yes, good. I was just going to say, but we haven't talked about Iris and mm -hmm. Claudia. Okay. Okay, here we go. Iris Brown, or Iris as I called her all those years, was a wonderful person to work with. She had a friend called Claudia Garant, and the two of them worked very well together, and both of them, but in a way, particularly Iris, had a lovely soft way with children and had a way about them that the children trusted them, that they were very sincere, that they had a good sense of what was right and wrong. And they were most happy surrounded by children, whether they would be doing crafts or whether they would be doing cooking. Um, and Iris loved to garden. She says that I taught her a few things. Mm -mm. She, she uh, didn't learn them from me. She was a natural gardener. And uh, if she wasn't a, a, a gardener, historically speaking, it was in her system to be a loving gardener and with some smarts. So Iris Brown, Claudia Garant, and wouldn't you know who would walk in quite a lot of times was Tomasita Romero, who was this beautiful, gracious lady in the area who was a good friend of you know, Iris, Iris and uh, Claudia. And between them, there was this wonderful sort of positive force down there at Norris Square with those three ladies. It was very good. And the kids benefited greatly from it. Um, great. Uh, I wanted to ask you, though, also that I know when Iris and you were first working together, um, mm -hmm. Iris did not was not speaking English at the time. 
and you mm -hmm. were not speaking Spanish. No, right. So how did that <laughs> dynamic work out? As far as me not speaking Spanish and Iris not speaking English very well, perhaps I just shouted a little louder. I don't know. No, 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 no. That was <laughs> that's that was tended to be the way when I was working in India with India and Magia. No, no, I don't know how we got on. I think she was a lot better at English than I was at Spanish. I did learn some Spanish at Penn. And I could say a few sentences, but not enough that it really helped. Iris recalled that she would bring tea to you um, often in the garden. If you want to elaborate on that, or if you remember that, um, but. <laughs> He said okay. that you you preferred tea with milk, which was a flat, which was blasphemy to her. But <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I think people were always making me tea down there, but I don't remember specifically. You you've reminded me of that, but being English, you you need to drink a lot of tea. It, it's it's the fuel, and so. That was it. I think I was still learning to drink coffee, but if you if you grow up in England, you drink tea, lots of tea. And if you're a workman in England, no matter where you work, the person you're working for will, will bring you tea. And I've noticed here that when a plumber, come, which is rare, I do all my own work, but whenever somebody comes to do something at the house, I say, would you like tea or coffee or, or juice? And they look at me like, what? No, I'm okay, I'm okay. It's sort of, they're a little uncomfortable with it. But of course in England, <clears throat> you sit down at least once mid morning for tea. You sit down at lunch for tea and you sit down mid-afternoon for tea. In fact, they used to joke between the tea breaks, do the English people get anything done much? You know, that was it. Good, that's, uh, that's a good joke. Um, but, um, or at least I, I got a kick out of it. So, um, but that's <clears> good <throat> to know. But so, uh, let, let me see. Um, I guess I wanted to, I think you've covered by now, you know, all your relationships with the staff at NSMP. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, Efrain, Iris, um, Andrea. Um, Claudia. Yes, Claudia. Claudia. Um, mm -hmm. And your initial, like, starting a relationship with Natalie Kempner, um, who is also Which was really... Wonderful, yeah. Yes. What a wonderful lady she was. Oh, my God. Yeah, do you want to actually elaborate a bit more on her if you have anything else to say? Well, I, I remember later, I was so grateful for, um, for Natalie for giving me time to, for Nancy and I to make a decision. Otherwise, I would have been under the hammer. And I have to say that at this point in time, um, her parents were very friendly and very nice to me, but later Nancy told me that her father was a little upset that this young man had come from abroad and was suddenly catching the eye of his daughter, that he had higher hopes. And her mother, although her mother denied it only a year ago, we brought it up to her, or two years ago, and for, she was our best friend. Nancy's mother was, Nancy's parents were incredible. They were lovely people. Everybody loved them. But uh, Nancy said that she, that first few months I was here, her mother went to her and said, now let me get this straight. This young man, seems to have very little money. He has no medical insurance and no degree. And this is the star that you are intending to hitch your wagon to. 
<laughs> and, and Nancy said yes. So that was it. But very shortly after that, she and I bought a fixer upper house on 24th and Panama, 24th and Panama Street for $24,000. Our mortgage was $143 a month. And I very quickly became involved with Fitler Square. I was on the Fitler Square Improvement Association for many, many years and helping to get that square to look really nice. And then, of course, later we worked on the Schuylkill Gardens. And, uh, but that was it. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to move forward now a little bit into the post 1986 um, years when you mm -hmm. left your position um, and went to um, the Friends School. Um, so how did your involvement with Norris Square change uh, since you left your position? Uh, and how has the NSMP green space changed since then? I think you've gotten a bit right. at that second question, but. Right. Um, I have to say that my involvement with Norris Square, almost as soon as I left, became practically non-existent. Um, I was aware that Sister Carol had moved back for a while, that Sister Carol was not a gardener, that Sister Carol was more a business type person, that she arranged something with work core for older children. I was aware that the focus of Norris Square with Natalie gone, me gone, changed from being environmental to more cultural job training, I think I went back once to take kids fishing. I went back once to do a work, a science workshop. Um, they called me up to get a second vehicle. I think I went down for two or three events, but I became so involved with my own life, Friend Central, uh, things I was doing elsewhere. Later, I became a trail master for the Gladwin, uh, the Bridal Wild Trails Association. I fixed up that house on Panama Street. We sold that. I then worked to fix up the house where we now live. I had two children come along. Uh, first, my son. I remember trying to be the director of Norris Square, holding a baby in one arm. Uh, that didn't work out too well. So I have to say, and also I felt that Norris Square was going in different directions than what I would have been more comfortable with. And then it was much later I heard they lost the ability to have, because of a fire code, to have children upstairs. So that basically I kind of <coughs> was saying to myself, when we were there, it went so well. It was, I'm not saying a golden age, but certainly when I was there, and I think before that with Natalie and, and with Efrain and <coughs> Andrea and Iris, they were wonderful years. And after that, I don't know what happened. I know they did lose their, their United Way membership. <coughs> and there were other things that happened that sort of changed it. And, you know, when you've been in something that goes so well, and now you're not involved, you've heard the phrase, well, you walk away from it. You know, it's you, you did your thing. And now I'm focusing on my kids. I'm focusing on Friends Central. I'm focusing on other things, you know? <laughs> okay, um, that's good to know. Um, sort of disappointing for you, I'm sorry, but that was it, you know, and uh, 
Yeah, that's fair. Um, <laughs> and I, well, I do want to ask you a little bit more though about um, the recent, most recent times you've returned. Um, but first I wanted to ask a clarifying question, um, which is uh, you mentioned a fire code um, that prevented kids from being upstairs. Yes. Um, could you explain why, elaborate on why that would be, why that was not the direction that you were, um, why that was moving it sort of in a different direction than you had been going with? Fine, sure. Um, I cannot remember, I don't think there was a fire escape outside at that time when I was there, but there was a move to something happened elsewhere there was a fire in a daycare somewhere else in philadelphia and it sort of pulled the city up short that here we have these daycares and nonprofits in row houses and are they safe and this is a story i heard that there were requirements that were often crippling to some of these places either you do this or do that or um, you have to close down. And I remember I went down to Ellen I because there was a threat that we couldn't use the upper floor at Norris Square. And we used that upper back room extensively for all kinds of workshops. And the office was upstairs in the front. And I went down to Ellen I and spoke to them and was getting nowhere until I went to the supervisor at LNI and he signed off and said, don't worry, you're fine. You can carry on. You know, I've looked at the situation. Uh, whereas the, the man I was dealing with literally was impossible. I remember once I was asking him questions and he spun his chair around and was facing the other way and answered a phone call. And then I sat there and sat there and sat there and he was on this phone call for 15 minutes and then he put the phone down, turned around and said, oh, you're still here? Boy, I said, I've been around the world and I've seen some bureaucrats, but you take the cake. And I went straight down to his supervisor's office and uh, I won't give you the name, you know, people knew of this man, he was like that. And the supervisor allowed me to carry on, but much later, these restrictions were placed on the building. How many numbers of children, ages, things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, that clarified things for me. Um, I wanted to, I guess, close a little bit by asking about your most recent visit to the North Square, I believe, um, in February yeah. 2020 um, with uh, Peter Kent and uh, with Iris Brown because uh, mm -hmm. the, you know there's a photo of you with um, some current Norris Square employees I believe I'm on their website so I wanted to ask you you yeah. know yeah about your experience then um, and uh, All right. if you have any thoughts about Norris Square's present or future that you'd like to add based on that. Fine well let's do that first part Yes. Um, uh, when Justin was there, Justin called me a couple of times to just, say, if, oh, excuse me, you mean Justin Trezor of yes. DHS? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Oh, um, no, do I? No, I no. Who was the uh, director before Teresa Elliott? That was Justin Trezor. Yes. Right, 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 right. Uh, he called up a couple of times and I met with him. He wanted to know how things used to be at Norris Square all those years ago. And I was able to tell him, just as I've been telling you. Um, but you haven't half of the, heard half of the programs that went on. They were just wonderful. Um, and then when Teresa came, she straightway called me up. And I went down a couple of times. And she came out here to my house to talk about the old days at Norris Square. And she said to me, well, we definitely want to get back to this gardening part. The therapy of gardening for people is so important. And so 
I met with her and some of her board members, and we talked about all of that. And then I went to a couple of events at Parcellus, Las Parcellus. I also went down and did some work at Las Parcellus. I did some, I tend to be a little obsess obsessive about things being orderly and, you know, and, and straight and no junk piles and come on, what are these weeds doing? Uh, but then I started to feel awkward with that. I didn't think that it was my place to go down. Uh, but then I was invited when Valerie, I think she was the secretary, uh, who was a little kid when I was there. There's a picture of Valerie there's a little kid in a canoe waving a paddle at me, or she's in the canoe with me and we're both waving paddles. Uh, Valerie uh, was retiring, I think, and they were honoring Valerie. So I went down there for that uh, and was honored to be included. You know, I'm such an old dinosaur. They shouldn't bring me out for these things. And I've always stayed in touch with Iris Brown. And just before we move on to where I think Norris Square is going, um, I've always been in touch with a handful of the kids that I taught years ago, you know, and uh, so that's been nice, but not many. Uh, but I'm just aware that we gave those kids a wonderful place to go in the summer, a wonderful place to go after school. I didn't tell you we put on plays. Uh, we did, you know, Christmas Carol. I think we did a rumple stilt skin or something and every and our stage was that five foot wide doorway as you go into the main part there, you walk through. That was our proscenium stage. And it, you know, and um, uh, what's his name? Ephraim's little kid was tiny Tim with a crutch. And all this stuff, and you know, and and uh, Ishmael Lazada, who looked like a rich businessman at the age of twelve, was you know Mr. Fezziwig, and it went on and on and on. But um, and we had haunted houses every year, and we discovered the most spooky sound in this haunted house. You know, we we took kids down the basement. Well, of course you can't take kids down the basement now; it's a fire hazard but we would creep around in the basement and we amplified the sound of somebody flushing the toilet upstairs. And we held a microphone against a, we took off a plate from the soil pipe and we recorded the sound of this water going <laughs> coming down the pipe. <laughs> it was like all any silly stuff. Okay, I don't know. where Where are we going? Oh, and we would take the kids camping to college settlement camp every year. We would take the kids out to my wife's aunt's farm out in Newtown Square by the Crum Creek, Mill Hollow. And we would have, a, that was tradition for the family to swing on a rope into the Crum Creek. And we took tents from Norris Square and we dug pits for the kids to go to the bathroom in, one for the girls, one for the boys. And it was all good stuff. And a college settlement camp, I remember once we had 26 kids fishing. I made fishing poles for all of them. And they caught something like, 50 plus fish and they were all excited with that you know and there was storytelling and campfire music where do i think norris square is going i don't know i really don't know so much as you say or as maybe you didn't say there seem to be less gardens in the immediate square area the two gardens that were southeast corner, southwest corner are gone. The Hunter School is gone. Um, gardens seem to disappear. Um, the one I did at Brown, it disappeared. Because the teach it needs effort to keep it up. You know, and teachers are so busy that although we won $50 prizes from Herb Clark through PHS, um, it, it needs people like Iris to keep it going, like La Parcellas, like La Parcellas and the Beatty Garden. It needs that, it needs that credit. I often wonder if 
that whole North American corridor. There's a lot of open ground there. Maybe it's all spoken for, but boy, wouldn't those areas make a nice, you know, sitting park, uh, vet, uh, community gardens. Um, but so much is getting built up now. And there's a lot of pressure on that neighborhood uh, gentrification. People are moving in. Maybe taxes are going up, real estate taxes, that there's pressure on people now that if there's a vacant lot, there's pressure to build on it. You know, there's pressure by developers, just as there is here in Narbeth. You know, there's a great demand. So where is, I don't know where Nara Square Neighborhood Project is going. It, it's up to the people who are running it now to look at the signs and decide, do we go back to environment? Do we make environment back being, not beyond gardening, do we make that be a component part of what we teach? Or, you know, I, I don't know quite what the future is there. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your time, Peter. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was some, um, those were some great final thoughts, I think, to wrap it up and talk about, you know. Yes, about yes, yeah, I'm talk too much, I'm sorry. No, it was great. I've learned so much from you, and I'm going to have to maybe get in touch with you also about the Schuylkill Community Garden. Um, if you'd be happy to talk about that, because we are trying to capture right. as many garden stories as possible and as community okay. gardeners, and as community gardeners would like us to help them capture. Um, so, yeah. and if you be think, if I did contact somebody at PHS, I forget. I spoke to Sally McCabe. Sally mm -hmm. McCabe put me onto this guy. I forget what his name was. I might have it written somewhere. He was responsible for, you know, deciding on article. And he said, well, maybe next summer. Uh, but I didn't send him any details. If I sent him some photographs and a brief story, I'm busy at the moment because we're singing in a choir. I'm leading a walk this weekend for Bridal World Trails. I've got two work weekends coming up cutting vines off trees and planting trees out in Gladwin in the woods. Um, we're very busy at the moment, but I could, I think it might be nice, a, a nice article for them to see what the stream was and what it is now. I mean, it's been quite a transformation. Mm -hmm. And as I say, most people, I, I live in, oh, this is an interesting area too, for you being, you know, horticulturalists. This is called the Narbrook Park, and it was designed and laid out by Frederick Pope, who was a disciple of, no, something Pope, who was a disciple of Frederick Lowell's Olmsted, the guy who laid out Central Park and Chicago and all this stuff. And the idea being, instead of giving everybody a, a house with a big garden, put the 33 houses around the edge and have a central area with a stream and trees that everybody shares. And it's delightful. You know, we all have like a fifth of an acre for a garden, very small, but we look out and all the houses are different. We look down the hill, we've just lost a couple of magnificent trees. They were ancient, uh, but there's the stream. There are other trees. And it's just a wonderful concept. We're not all mowing all day long, you know. The, you know, that's it. and we pay for our roads. We pay for the mowing of the central areas. Wow. So that's an, another thing that you might maybe you should come out and just visit, look around, you know. Yeah, I would love to. I would. I really want to visit, you know, all the public green space in the Greater Philadelphia area. Um, right. And Olmstead design is something. Uh, I am interested in as well. So, um, he but did. I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yes. So, um, yeah, but so I wanted to say um, again, thank you so much. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. the recording now. Um, sure. Okay.